Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today I am super excited to welcome back for round two, a special guest, Trader Ferg, everyone's uh, favorite trader on Twitter. Ferg is a full-time trader with seven years of experience focusing on uncovered opportunities in the most unpopular sectors of the market. Through his Twitter account and new sub stack, which we're going to talk about, he shares his current thoughts on the market and provides an excellent analytic opinion. The link will be in the video description. His investment heuristics include asymmetrical positioning in sectors often overlooked by conventional investors, and he is the master of this idea known as subsidized asymmetry. You can check that out in our first conversation. Examples of sectors that currently tickle his fancy are thermal coal, uranium, offshore services, and the controversial tin. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the podcast, Ferg. How are you doing, sir? Thank you. Thanks for having me back, man. Yeah, it's always fun. Yeah, my pleasure, mate. Disclaimer, guys, uh, anything that we say is not to be construed as financial advice. Uh, we're not financial advisors. This is just two guys having a chat and is to be um, treated as such. Uh, today, mate, I thought we'd uh, get straight into it and talk about any macro changes or things that have surprised you since we last spoke. What has surprised you most in terms of price action or capital flows uh, since we last spoke? Uh, well, one would be, I honestly didn't see like the likes of one of the biggest surprises, definitely Newcastle coal trading where it is now. Like when, when we were coming out the back of the last energy crisis, you can, you could look at the futures and see there was a hefty premium being given to the next year, next winter. And even if you went out even further, you could almost see it another year out. And so there was kind of a, an understanding at that point that, yeah, this was going to be a reoccurring issue. But as the years gone on, that's all disappeared. Obviously, we've um, traded down where I didn't even think we would. I was sort of thinking there would be some sort of a flaw around sort of 170, 180. Yeah, didn't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that obviously Seems got blown out. The, so, the basement. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, no, that's probably been the biggest surprise. I always tell myself not to underestimate sort of commodity volatility and then I always underestimate it. So yeah, that would probably be the biggest one. It's kind of in fitting with my whole concept of just volatility is the price you pay for performance. It's all it's all easy to see that um, coal's going to be a beneficiary for a long time yet, but it doesn't help with kind of the ride as you will. Like the, there is big drawdowns and then the realization that nothing got fixed that what we experienced last winter was a whole lot of kind of stars aligning if you will you had the warmest winter in in 40 years in some of the european countries and on record and and some of them as well you had covid um, lockdowns in china which um kind of run through some of the charts there which i think it's it's even been understated how much of a a difference it was because they're just comparing it to 2022 20, con consumption of LNG when the more interesting fact is every year it's grown 20% on top so it wasn't just the difference between the pre previous year it was the previous year and the normal level of growth so that's that's a huge one and lastly just seeing the wheels really start to fall off the whole um whole sort of wind and solar narrative like we're actually finally starting to see some of the um the wind um the wind turbine makers just absolutely hemorrhage money like the one that i've pointed out a few times is Virtus had raised prices 30 percent last year and still came in with a negative eight percent um margin so i don't know how that business is supposed to scale <laughs> Yeah, and, especially yeah, especially when we're considering the costs of well, well just general inflation from labor to uh, input goods costs and, and all the rest of it. Are you thinking that it, it appears to be at the moment that people have just figured that this was a or last year I should say was a one off when TTF mm -hmm. um, Dutch TTF futures went through the roof? But my question to you, well, what actually has changed to fix that energy yes. crisis that we had last year? Have we got like more gas infrastructure? Have we got more nuclear? It seems to me to be less, if anything. Yeah, well, there's been some interesting stuff going on behind the scenes and a lot of the 
one of the emerging countries were pretty pissed off. They got um, they got shafted with their LNG. So it was they've applied for like stricter, more long term contracts so that they can't um, they can't get sort of outbid for it again. You've obviously got China back in the picture out of lockdown. So Europe is not in a position to grab as much of the LNG market as it did last time around if it has a cold winter. So that's that's a big difference. You've got the difference of there's just there's just complete stupidity thinking they can um, they can get energy independence out of um, wind and solar. Like we've just we've already seen um, seen the attempts at that and the likes of Germany and now um, and California and Australia, some of them are actually starting to um, achieve like negative pricing. And there's, I think there's a big misconception with that. When some people think of negative pricing as kind of a market signal that we've achieved cheap energy, I, I view it as it's, it's a broken market. It's the power uh, at that point has got so cheap that it's, um, it's got no, it's just waste energy, essentially. You, you're not matching the um, generation to the duck curve, which is this the idea that we use more power in the morning and in the afternoon when you get home. Um, and solar, you profile generation is the opposite. You're producing oh, during the day and when, when most of the day. <laughs> yeah, and you got you got no ability to shift it to where you need it. And so, at a certain point, you just don't need more solar in your um, in your grid. And yet, um, there's this, these crazy buildouts going on. And of course, yeah, you've got the capacity factor chart up. The yeah. capacity factor there is um, is even misleading because that that's in a that's in like an ideal spot for solar. You'd be achieving a twenty four percent capacity factor. So Germany has only been averaging eleven yeah, percent, and because um, of its weather patterns and exposure to sun, yeah, and just, the rest of it, just cloudy. And then what no one ever mentions with solar as well is just a, the sheer seasonality. So you've got the you got the mismatch of um, solar generation during the day to the duck curves. So just trying to shift the the peak generation during the day to when you need it in the evenings and at night. And then you've got the mismatch between winter and summer. So with um, a known European, um, the, yeah, European countries, the difference is obvious. Oh, sometimes larger than fifty percent. So you produce fifty percent wow. more in the summer than you, and so you've got no way to shift that. And when yeah, you try and read about, it. no, you can't store it from the summer to winter. You can't even store it during the day economically yet. Like, <laughs> keep hearing about batteries, but when you dig into what most of the batteries are doing, is most of it's actually grid stabilization. It's not actually even storage. Like, if you look at the one um, Tesla built in Australia, the vast majority of that battery's use is just um, it's because with solar, it's just like, um, forgetting the, the term for it, but it's just like instantly into the grid. You don't have like a um, kind of like a lag that you do with coal, um, gas, nuclear. And so, um, yeah, you need, you need a buffer. And so that means that only, only um, portion of the battery is actually going to storage. So most of these batteries are only achieving sort of four hours, um, four hours that they can add in, it's, it's not, yeah, if you've looked at any of um, the sort of long-term um, studies of how long you can go, particularly with wind, you can have periods a week or two with no wind. It's not unusual. And so to think four hours is going to gonna help doesn't, doesn't stack up. Yeah, so four hours is a little bit, oh, a long way short of, of two weeks. And so let's mm. say, let's play this out. Let's presume that next winter in the Northern Hemisphere is not a record, a new record, um, warm winter we've had obviously North, North Stream pipeline is shall we say out of action you've mm. got Germany their nuclear has been all rolled out or all phased out now I don't think yep. they have uh, basically any more nuclear so would that not lead to more pressure on gas but in the absence of gas and ga or gas infrastructure the burden is going to be left to coal to fill I mean what else can fill that that need that's my take yeah I think Coal is the ultimate um, beneficiary of this. That's what this whole article was titled. Yeah, yeah. coal is the beneficiary of dumb energy policy, and yeah. that's that's the way I see. It. I think it's this this illusion that we're going to have wind and solar and LNG, whereas um, LNG can't can't fill the hole. And if anything, it's 
we, we, whenever whenever an LNG project gets signed off, about seventy percent is um, fixed in long term contracts, and that's the thirty percent that remains on spot that everyone fights over. And so that's what I was mentioning before as well is that a lot of these um, the sort of um, more developing countries that got shafted last time around, they've made sure that they've tightened up their contracts so that that won't happen again. So that um, that amount that's kind of floating on spot is um, is getting it's getting less and less. And in a, in a funny way, the Europeans were actually quite like they always assumed that they would be the kind of the the premium market. So they always kind of dismissed the more fixed contracts because they always thought yeah they would be um, out of sort of pay up when they needed to and that's obviously now when they come up against the likes of China and stuff it. yeah they certainly did and so yeah the, it's always been the observation mine that um, gas and coal just go hand in hand and with um, it's a tight correlation and with especially Newcastle you're, um, you're getting it dirt cheap like the the Newcastle coal plays are just all trading one two times cash flow buying back stock hand over fist it's just a um, an easy trade to make. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I wanted to ask you. And then you just put the the doubt into my mind. I thought, well, natural gas is a tricky market to play. I've never really delved into it because it's not a global market as such. And would, I mean, would you be tempted to punt on TTF futures or anything like that? Given the fact you just mentioned, we expect particularly that market to be super skinny next year, or are you just looking at saying, well, look, coal is such, such low hanging fruit here. It's such a fat pitch. It's just so much harder to to get it wrong. Why don't you just look at, you know, I guess, the the white havens of, of the world, that if they're going to be huge beneficiaries of the coal price, um, if we get another squeeze, and even at current prices, they're still making decent free cash flows, and because they've been, I guess, constrained by the the regulations here in Australia, all they can do with it is really pay back shareholders. Yeah, yeah, it was just buybacks. So they've got two billion on the balance sheet, so they'll. I've got a long runway of buybacks even without earning another incremental dollar. <laughs> and um, yeah, as for TTF, I, I don't mess with futures. I've learned my lesson trying to deal with leverage a while back. The only time I get involved in futures is with uh, future options when the, um, the setup's juicy enough. But yeah, futures are too hard, especially if you're dealing with something super volatile. I like to sleep well at night and not have any, any sort of margin <laughs> bouncing around in the account. So yeah, coal, coal's a cut far cleaner way to play this. And um, and yeah, they're just cash cows, really. And it, as you say, it, the, it's just observing in a whole lot of the, um, some of the releases, like some of the majors, like even BP, you can just read between the lines that they're high grade in their portfolios. So you have this weird, this weird setup where, I, I don't know if I put the chart in here, but the, um, it's the capex. You've got um, said spikes in um, the price, and the capex didn't budge at all. If anything, it went down a little bit, and um, and everyone still wants it off their books. You've got the 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 large miners that are trying to um, get rid of it off their books as quickly as possible, so they're high grading it. You've got the um, you've got the like the mid levels, like the the white havens that yeah. It's, no, I didn't put it in. It says it's that chart, but it's got an overlay, the one that's this bar graph up that you just scrolled past. Ah, uh, okay. Um, right. just, we're, we're referencing <laughs> Ferg's uh, sub stack here, guys. So everything for our audio only, list, audio only listeners, the link will be in the description. And I highly recommend you go through and, and have a look because we'll be referencing that work in our discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So essentially... Going from the, the major miners, so the BHPs, they're high grading and they're trying to get off their books. They're trying to sell. BHPs trying to get rid of two of it. So they run to that met coal, but they're trying to get those off their books, trying to sell. So we'll find out probably that in the next two months. Um, you've got the sort of mid-level, the White Havens. Um, and the interesting thing with them is even though they've got the cash on the books to develop, they've even got development projects in the pipeline they just can't justify it when they can buy their own stock back at sort of one to two times earnings. Like, well, why, why go, why go through all the effort of developing a mine? Granted, they are sort of still working towards it with some, um, but yeah, why go through all the effort when you can just buy back your stock at a silly valuation? Like, the market is not paying you to go out and develop assets, 
And so then, yeah, so that's next level down. And then you go to like the, the more junior or developing miners and they can't get access to finance. So, and they can't do it out of their own cash flow. They're going to try to get up and running. And they're also just battling and sort of permitting and stuff. Yeah, I'm, and, having, um, uh, I'm having flashbacks of nightmares of Allegiance Coal when you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's this prime example of this. And, and this chart that you've got up um, here for anyone that can't see it, it's just a breakdown of the percentages of um, thermal coal quality, um, coal exports by quality. And one of the interesting things across the world is guys that have got the highest quality coal are also generally the most sort of ESG um, focused with the exception of Russia. And Russia's obviously kind of been excluded out of, um, out of the market. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you've got kind of, and what you need to remember with high quality coal is generally underground. So it takes a lot more capex, a lot longer, um, a lot more yeah, money to bring it online. And so with Australia, um, you got United States, um, you got Colombia, they've got a, a pretty green, um, yeah, Petro is not, uh, not yeah. going to dig out any more coal anytime soon. Um, he, he actually had a headline. He said, I'm going to leave it in the ground. Yeah. Um, South Africa is a mess at the moment. Granted, they are still, um, yeah, they're still, their logistics are a mess, but they are still um, producing. So, yeah, it's interesting. And then, yeah, the big ones that could actually move the needle, the likes of Indonesia here, it's all um, low quality coal. It's, um, it's all open pit. And, and so, are those two yeah. countries, um, I read somewhere, I could be wrong, but are they looking at more, I guess, protectionist or nationalistic policies, reducing their exports because their grids have been suffering. Um, and so instead of exporting so much, they're, they're going to keep more of their local production for their own grids. Have you seen much on that? Yeah, so that in Indonesia, as I always joke, it was a, we're going to go through a sort of a global energy crisis with people screwing up the grids. You want to be in Indonesia because they force the local producers to sell at $70 a tonne, regardless of wherever it trades on the open market. And um, if ever they run short, they just ban exports. And so they did that. And they did that at the start of 2022. And then it's just actually taking a really nationalistic um, sort of angle on a lot of its commodities. And so it'll be interesting. They actually did sort of a, a world tour to around a lot of the developing countries telling them to um, keep their commodities in house, try and value, add value to them themselves, um, not, not sell them on. Yeah. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when you already have that sort of a, a rhetoric and a lot of these um, commodities haven't really even started to do what I think they might do in the future. Okay. So how much, how much of your portfolio is broken into, uh, I guess, income focused, income generation, versus some of those uh, multi-baggers or capital gains. Do you have any rules of thumb that you use for that? I know it's going to be different for everyone's um, particular circumstances, but I'd be interested to get your thoughts on, you know, do you have one book that you're just looking at for, um, uh, I guess, milking that income and another book that's really hunting out that potential asymmetry that we spoke about in your introduction? So I... I when I first quit my job, I had two very distinctly different portfolios. I had a, just a straight income portfolio. That was how I made my salary. And then I had my long-term portfolio. And I did that um, just because I wanted to sort of split like in the mindset of what I was trying to achieve with each account. Like it's, it can really screw you up if you're trying to achieve both within the same account. Like a, a, I'm just trying to think like an example of it would be if you were, say you were, so you were buying a stock, um, just trying to think of, well, we just mentioned Whitehaven, so why not use that? Um, and say it was a, um, whatever, say it's 10 bucks just to make um, it easy. Then if, if you were to sell, say, a one-month um, covered call, earn 50 cents, that'd be 5% return on the month. And the income portfolio, if you achieve that and, say Whitehaven doubled, I would still view that as success because the purpose of that portfolio is just to generating make the income. 5% income per month. It's, 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 yeah, it's generating that. You can't look at the opportunity cost of doubling, whereas in the long-term portfolio, that would be an absolute disaster. And so the um, you're going at it with very two different sort of um, 
mindsets and I always yeah I always like to keep them separate granted when I was struggling to find opportunities in 2019 and so I turned my whole income portfolio into cash and then when COVID came around I saw opportunities I never thought I would so I put that all that cash into um, some of the some of the setups I saw and so I no longer run the separate income portfolios they're both um, now long term but when I see a juicy income set up, um, I'll go after it and um, just do it. Yeah, and had, it's far far more rare. So going from like trying to write options every month to now, I probably only probably only write a full cover call every few months, maybe every six months when I really set set up. Okay, and in terms of the as a percentage of your portfolio, how has that changed over time? Were you initially like? had just enough to cover your expenses in the income portfolio and you were really trying to build wealth in the other portfolio. How did you, how did you look at, I guess, dividing the two in terms of weighting? Yeah. So it was, it was literally geared around that. I was, um, I was just trying to make enough to survive and then everything that was surplus to that, I was putting into the, so the longer term um, strategies. I was very lucky that uh, kind of a strategy I ran um, from when I left, worked really well and that um that allowed me to put quite a bit of capital across into the long term and that's kind of allowed me to really build up my portfolio as well it is um yeah like with, with income trading it is very hit and miss in that there's times when the volatility really sets up to absolute print money and there's times where you just get run over if you go in because volatility is too low and you just you're not getting compensated for the risk you know Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking of uh, Peabody a while back there. We had nice juicy volatility to, to write against. It was nice. In terms of currently, as you look out the window, which sector would take your fancy? Uh, we talked about coal, uh, which is, uh, while everyone's forgotten about it, I actually love it right now um, because you, know, you look at the likes of the White Havens and it's trading similar to where we were um, a couple of years ago, uh, it's come come down by almost half, and yet their balance sheet's mm-hmm. clean, and coal looks like it's got more upside than downside. But coal versus uranium versus oil, in particular offshore, I know is a space you uh, like to talk about. And then I just have to ask you about tin because I'm a metal X bag holder, and I want you to tell mm-hmm. me that tin is going to go up. Can you just do that for me? Can you just tell me it's going to go up? <laughs> I, th- I think tin will go up. I just hate all the companies in the space now. Yeah. They just piss me off. Well, there are only two. How can you go wrong? I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, one, yeah, Buddy Alperman is yeah, ending up in the DRC and I don't know how to size that. And yeah, I don't even think it's that cheap anymore. And then I don't even know what Metals X is doing. Their governance is a bit dodgy. That's what selling a gold mine to one of their, their parent companies as the owner. Like, how does that even get across the line? They, um, no, that's yeah, like nearly um, half their market cap in cash, supposedly. I mean, it's yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm actually out of tin. I sold out of tin um a few months ago. So um I just I I have like when I've done a lot of work on a thesis, I'm getting better at just putting it on the shelf and waiting for it to set up and then I'll come back to it. If I don't think it's the time for it, then um and with tin, I'm not as sure of the demand side. I, I understand the supply side well. I think it'll do really well, but I just don't see the demand catalyst. I think I've got it wrong in that. Um, it is the metal glue. A lot of awful, lot of electronic electronics demand got pulled forward in COVID, mm. and I think that's put a big dampener on it. Um, moving forward, and I am far more comfortable being at the like if you split between opex commodities and capex commodities i think i'm far more comfortable being in the opex like i want to be in like the inputs of all the um digging the stuff up and that's more focused on the energy side and yeah really if you split my portfolios between oil is just the the master commodity and then between that i view it as uranium and coal are kind of hedging each other coal is when you screw up your energy policy and uranium is what we should be doing and it's a standard loan investment because just need to supply all the reactors like it's just a, a simple exercise of um how many reactors are in the world how much has been mined and um needs, needs to be enough um moving forward and there isn't so everything that's been happening with sort of 
countries pivoting back to uranium is all just icing on the cake. The thesis worked without that. And um, yeah, it's looking better and better. And if you're interested in which uranium companies Ferg has his money in, that's available for premium members uh, in Ferg's Substack, link in the description. Now, talking about those OPEX v CAPEX and talking about oil being the master commodity, uh, it's no secret, everyone knows my main exposure is in the oil uh, sector. Let's talk about why offshore, why now? Uh, and you've just written an amazing uh article delving into this thesis uh do you want to summarize the thesis and then we can delve in uh using some of these charts i guess as as visual cues yeah certainly so well this is i i wrote an article previously that was just why i said oil's fat pitch and it was just the idea that essentially i think demand's going to hold up and decline rates are really high yeah it's it's this chart in front of us yeah depends who you ask it's anyone's forecasting to four percent crew to um people I respect like I think, I think Josh Young was up around the six or seven percent decline and so that gets you from with no additional um supply coming on you, you're gonna go from the 100 million barrels to sort of the um 40 by 2040 this I think this is yeah, uh, yeah. What, what is this land this lands at um, 2030 yeah yeah I, so yeah so it's there so yeah by 2040 yeah be down around the 20 which is just for everyone that's kind of i understand the people that are bearish oil short term like there's some great traders i actually just finished watching um a interview between um alex alexander stad and michael cow and they've got a lot of great points but when you actually dig um beyond their like short like six months even a year they're both they're both actually bullish oil yeah they both got oil investments so i think it's always key to understand like trading short term and with which they're very good and understanding that this is just this relentless drop is um unless you kind of you believe some of the stuff coming out of kathy wood who's saying like evs are just gonna destroy oil demand and then that's you can actually go through and work out like it's people are often surprised how little of oil actually goes to passion passenger vehicles. Like if you actually take um that hundred million um barrels, only half of it actually goes into transport in the first place. And then passenger vehicles are only um they're only twenty uh, they're only like twenty, twenty-eight percent of um total consumption. And then you take it that of all the cars today, only about three percent um are actually evs and so <laughs> and you're assuming you're you uh, an electrical grid in india and bangladesh and pakistan and those types of places exactly good yeah. luck with that. It, no it just it doesn't work and so yeah that, that's where this article starts and then from there it's like okay well, we need to plug this gap so how are we going to plug this and the um consensus was generally that it'd be shale shales added pretty much every incremental barrel for the last decade has come from uh come from shale and so like that that colorful chart there that's um uh up higher this this yeah this one this one is this is kind of like the consensus view of what will what will um plug the gap would be um shale essentially doubling so here um also it's a bit older from 2018 but they're saying by 2025 shale was um doubled and what we're quickly finding out is that it's it's rolling over it's not it's, it's struggling to grow let alone uh, let alone double again this for a whole lot of reasons um essentially a lot of it got high graded and this was just in the shale boom the pursuit for um sort of growing was just going after all the good stuff first um then you've got and just in the nature of the shale like the engineering like you you get the oil out very quickly but you, mm. you front end load your production essentially and so you deplete your wells that much faster yeah huge decline rates it, it, it's it's interesting when you kind of think of it that um most booms you actually have a really lasting benefit from it like you if you if you have like a boom and sort of a offshore deep water they've got like 10 percent declines so the boom will set you up for a long time out in the future kind of like um I'm trying to think of like analogies for it like if you um 
I don't know, I guess like a kind of like in the tech boom, like installing all the fiber optics, like it, you benefit from that for years out, all that stuff going, um, having a massive build out and then a blow up is actually hugely beneficial. But with shale, it's all just going to be kind of a more of a flash in the pan. It's kind of this idea that you, yeah, you have to do be. more and more to keep, um, you have to run faster and faster, stay in the same place because you've got these 70% sort of um, declines. And so that's what we've kind of seen here is um, there is still a few fields that are uh, doing well, like the Permian, but none of it's growing and a lot of it is really starting to roll over. And um, that's what I'm kind of talking about here, saying that shale's um, struggling to even hold its ground, let alone grow. And so it's not going to be the growth engine um, moving forward. And yeah, the, these are all the different um, uh, US shale, shale fields bar the Permians, this Eagleford, Vulcan, which are the two big ones. And as you can see from this chart, it's, it's not seen new highs. It's, um, it's if anything trending lower. And also this is working through a lot of the drilled but uncompleted. So um, yeah, like and since of, COVID, if you look at the ducks, the drilled but uncompleted wells, they're, they're almost, well, they're basically depleted now. So it's not as if those wells that were shut in, we don't have those to just start digging oil out again. It's going to have to be more exploration and, um, and successful drill hits. Um, but if you've seen the mapping of some of that area, like it, it appears to be exhausted. Like they've just ripped through yeah. all that square meterage of, of potential dr uh, drilling sites. So if it's not going to be shale, Ferg, where's the oil going to come from? Yeah, well, the, the next one was like, often people claim it'll be conventional, like the Saudis will suddenly ramp and um, kind of talked about Saudi before, how they're just playing a big shell game. They tried to IPO um, Aramco back in, um, I forget what year it was, the, anyway, few years ago and kind of got laughed out of the room and so what they did is they brought their ipo back to their domestic market and kind of encouraged a whole lot of their elites to um to buy it and trade it and ensure that it got this two trillion market cap and so it's yeah really a big game of um smoke and mirrors um they don't have what they say they have um posted some links here that um just go through it. Like Josh Young's done some good work on it, saying every time they um, sort of claim they can go up to um, sort of max out the production, sort of push up past 12, even 13 um, million barrels a day, then they draw down um, their inventories. You've got this, this was a great article by Bloomberg that was saying, like, what's that 2 trillion uh, valuation based on? And it's, it's only 2% of the shares um, float and of them, only um there's only like 50 million a day and most of it's just like um like wash trading like merry-go-round like just people trading back and forward and so that's kind of i think sam bankman funny. freed was in charge of the ipo yeah. of this yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it smelled like crypto but yeah so anyway they, these are the two big spots that um were supposed to move the needle and um don't see it and so that really leaves um offshore and and Funny thing with offshore is we've kind of always known it was um, it, there was some um, highly quality stuff. Um, there was a lot of like reserves out there. It was just expensive, and no one wanted to do long cycle um, sort of investments. It's um, and you still had shale in that uh, in that era, so you didn't really need to. I guess would be the argument. Exactly, like with with all the rhetoric of ESG, and we're gonna we're gonna wean ourselves off oil and be net zero why why on earth would you want to do um sort of a a 10 year plus um sort of um long cycle sort of offshore um project and so yeah they even though they had the reserves they never got any of the money and this is it was looking to recover as per this chart here it was it was starting to look okay into 2019 then you got absolutely hammered by COVID, um and so that was just that was when we saw the bankruptcy cycle really kick off and saw just one after the others go down and just the noble Polaris, Cedral, Diamond, just pop, 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 the whole um, sector went under. And this was already after they'd already been cutting costs since um, since oil crashed in 2014. So they're already pretty lean. And then um, just yeah, COVID took them out. So they 
all restructured mostly was debt for equity swaps so the debt holders um became new equity holders the original equity holders got um, cleaned out and um so as a result what happens to the cost curve now that all that debt has magically uh, been washed off the balance sheet because that's where it really becomes interesting from i guess drill cycle economics we're just talking about offshore yeah so um i've got two charts in the presentation that you can just see the drops so you started off um you started off at 90 dollars a barrel um was the off the back of sort of um 2014 so that was that was what they were projecting for um for offshore and then um I think this was 2019 you were down to 43 and then finally off the back of um off the bankruptcy cycle you got right down to 36 you actually got below shale and surprisingly enough you're within speed distance of um yeah this is the other chart there's one more version of this chart so this is 2019 and then you get down to yes this is what this is pretty much where it is currently so yeah, you would so explain this distance. to us. Explain, uh, explain this to audio list audio listeners only. What does that mean? What and why is it important if deep water, let's say or offshore, is analogous to break even costs, let's say, of the the Middle Eastern conventional wells? Why is that such a big deal? It's because everyone still has it in their mind that it's expensive and makes no mm -hmm. sense, and that shale will be just the powerhouse that can come on cheaply. And so the fact that um, the fact that the cost curve has come down that much, I don't think many people are aware of it at all. And it's well, most it can't be given just, the way these things have been trading, and they've just been sort of flat to slightly up. This is, yeah, this exactly. is it just seems so obvious. It's like, well, like this is this is where the capex is going, and like, why haven't people started bidding up the the companies that own these offshore? I guess rigs or services uh, are even better. Well, it's because there's generally no capex flowing at the moment, which is one of the biggest issues. Is similar to coal, there's been an awful lot of shareholder returns and not a lot of capex flowing, and so we're just starting to see that change. If if you have watched carefully, the likes of BP and Shell, they, like the, I think the chart that I've referenced the most was. Um, Ben Van Buren, the um, the Shell CEO, he um, was interviewed and he said, "I no longer um, view myself as an oil CEO." And like he was referencing, like they're sort of going into green investments, and then he's um, he's left, and now, as they uh, say, he's no longer with us. Yeah. yeah, he's no longer with us, and the new guy is fully pivoting back into oil. <laughs> and they're, and they're, yeah, and so it's. It was just a period in time that, um, yeah, that we won't need it in the future. We'll, um, we'll all become these green energy companies. And now as they're coming back, the deep water um, reserves present a big chunk of um, their kind of reserves that on their, um, on their balance sheet or on their um, books. And yeah, just need the, um, the CapEx to start flowing in because it, as I say it's the um some of the cheapest of the economics are going to be um the best and i don't believe that that was shale that shale is probably still true of some of the permian stuff but across the board um i'd say it's a lot higher and also like the average um the average break-in even can be a bit misleading so i think i have another chart after this where it kind of show the distribution of um sort of developed resources and what's quite interesting with offshore is um like 50 like half of it's below 40 dollars um a barrel and so and where is, would that uh, be a specific geographic uh area where you've got your lower cost curves a good question i don't actually know how this is geographically spread yeah i'm I just thinking out loud totally as to you know why it's so like the the median you've got such a low uh or on one side of the median you've got such a low cost to break even and then it's like this huge um, uptick to the right there i don't know maybe it was harsh geology to get the rigs out there i don't know i thought i might pose a question to you yeah i'd, I'd say some of that would definitely be um shallow middle east um would be the cheaper stuff and then yeah obviously as you go further out um it's going to get more expensive that would, that would be logical but yeah i, I don't 
I don't know, especially what that, um, obviously the largest proportion there in the 25, uh, sorry, the 30, 35, be interested where that sits in the world. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, interesting. Uh, places like offshore Brazil and Guyana um, look interesting. Have they caught your, caught your attention at all? Yeah, they certainly have. I had a great um, three-hour chat with um, Fern Guerrero, and she she's just an absolute encyclopedia on it. She worked her whole life um, in sort of um, drilling projects like for Chevron. And, um, yes, she's hugely bullish, Guyana. Um, my thing is I just feel like it's outside of my circle of competence, um, understanding a lot of the sort of um, what will work and what won't. And so that's why I find myself trying to keep it simple um, and sticking more with just the, um, I, don't know, I call it the picks and shovels approach. I just want to stay with the guys that will benefit or playing it directly via option futures. So whether it's the offshore rigs, the OSVs or the option futures, that's generally where I find myself hanging out. Which leads me to my next question quite nicely, actually, in terms of, your thoughts on OSVs versus the rigs. Uh, my thoughts, the OSVs to me just look amazing when, for a few reasons, mainly because you have shorter duration contracts. And so if you know, if we're right in our thesis and we're thinking that the utilization rate is going to go up and we're going to have, it's going to be a big lag time to get new rigs or new, strip, new ships built, then mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't you want to have short duration contracts? Is every six months you you go to your, your contractor and say, hey, mate, I know it was 450 last six months, but, you know, it's got to be half a mil uh, a day now because, you know, you haven't got a choice basically versus some of the rigs, which are what, 365 day contracts normally? Be interested to get your yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it's, it's a business that gets killed in a downturn. There's been having your, your three to four months, so it's a double day short. I guess that's the other side of the get, hockey stick. Yeah, yeah, but you get... Um, as you say, you just get like massive earning power as it just constantly re-rates because you've got such a quick turnaround. And it was kind of a, one of the observations I kind of made early on with offshore is as drill ships reached full utilization, the um, the semi-subs are going to have to step up because for anyone that isn't aware, it's like a, you got um, jack-ups that can go up to a certain depth and then you've got semi-subs that can go um, out to, I think it's 10 thousand feet and then you've got drill ships which can also service that and deeper and so when um i'm not sure if i had the chart here i have um, seen it in one, in one of your articles i don't know if it's in I, I, I think it was on the previous article yeah and so when um when there wasn't enough work to go around obviously the more expensive um drill ships yeah there it is that, that's it yeah and so yeah the the jack ups um are out to around 9,000 meters and semi subs are around 10,000. The drill ships can go out to 12. Um, so plus. it kind of, I guess, the capex goes from right to left in this case because it's easier to put a barge and then the jack up's the next best thing and then semi sub and drill ship. Is that is that the way it works? Yeah, it is. But with drill ships, you want to keep the crew going and you've got a far newer asset so they would, um, and you need less support so they would kind of eat the semi submersibles lunch. And so that's why the semi-submersible market is the last one to recover. Uh -huh. And once drill ships have kind of hit full utilization and the semi-subs are coming back in and with each semi-sub you need four OSVs. And so that drags the OSV market up with it. And that's what we kind of seen is the OSV market really take off in line with that. And yeah, as you kind of pointed out, the most, most rigs are, um, depends really on sort of, three-year contracts, I guess, would be average. Some, there were longer ones last cycle. I think Transocean even signed out to 10 years, but I think three, maybe five years would probably be the max this time around. I, I doubt we'd see 10 again. But, um, yeah, you get a heap of talk um, out of OSVs. Granted, you don't have the same, you don't have the same, like, level of moat. Like, you don't, when you consider a an OSV um, replacement cost is maybe 60, 70 million. Um, perhaps by the end of this um, sort of energy crisis and um, lack of shipping may possibly higher. Um, but at the moment, you, you're picking them up uh, with the likes of sort of Tidewater for eight, nine um, million 
on the books and with the most of the um the offshore drillers the drill ships um are sort of up around uh, a billion and yeah they've obviously equally written down but will be far harder to um to replace you do have a bigger a bigger moat in that way um so yeah the the osv is a, a great talky way to play um sort of a recovery whereas the the sort of um the rigs will have probably more of a moat is also the the kind of construction the shipyards of them the financing no one will finance these things anymore like they used to be used to be sort of 10 percent down now it's 40 50 percent so no one's going to do that day rates you need to even for anyone to even pull the trigger would need to be i've seen it up as high as 700 day rates before it would even make sense to consider that and then are the and, shipyards uh, you still got the same amount of shipyards or are they all contracted for for other builds what do you reckon the earliest yes, you start to see a real they could make a real dent into the supply side of this thing ah uh, so it's it's the pre-fill up till like some people talk to have said that yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't get a space out till late 2025 at the earliest so that's before you could even possibly get an order in and that's because there's um a fill up with container ships with um lng and um and just generally these guys got absolutely shafted in the last cycle a lot of these guys have still had sort of rigs on their balance sheet that they were trying to get rid, rid of up, up until lately and so the idea that they're going to jump back in and some of them have also been retooled for like sort of uh offshore wind projects as well mm. like the old the old story of um like doing doing the popular thing um and so yeah i see there's at least a, before before the order book could even start to fill you probably we got at least two to three years and you'd need day rates to or well, not quite double but where, where would the average day rate be at the moment for drill ships there aren't that many hovering around i think there's one at 500 a day yeah the, every, everyone had their eyes on the the one taking out 500 the whole sector really that was down here yeah, it, it, um, with transocean in in australia somewhere yeah transocean yeah knocked it over um yeah the the average day rate would still probably be down about 400 i mean yeah. depend, it depends what you're talking yeah i'll see across all the different um makeups you've got different rates for the different specs um but yeah it's all it's all moving and and for anyone i'm sort of familiar with the the utilization is what kicks off the day rate so it's just um once you obviously hit full utilization day rates will um take off we've got a bit of supply that can come on that's been cold stacked but um yeah these things these things are shitty businesses for the better part of a decade and then they'll have a window where before they can bring a whole lot of supply and screw it on they'll print a whole lot of cash and then they'll yeah bring supply on and go back to being shitty businesses for another decade so the yeah. um you just you jump into them uh when you understand the dynamic and you don't overstay your welcome yeah it's a good question i liken them to like hotels or, or caravan parks in mining towns uh, where they ghost towns but not <laughs> yeah. nine years out of ten but what that one year where they they start to rip you want to be involved okay are you happy to outline i guess just generally how you're playing this uh this theme and you mentioned we need to remember not to outstay uh, our welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a, I am somewhat of a rig charlatan, I guess. I've been in uh, various places of Transocean for a while. What do I need to keep in mind? When do I need to uh, start dancing near the door, would you say? What, what are we looking out for? I uh, definitely just watching the order book. Um, seeing, yeah, that will invariably screw it up on a long enough time frame. So... Uh, yeah, just one, once they start uh, building the order book, that would be definitely have me heading for the door. Um, you're going to scale out, be, or you're going to take the chips off the table once you once you see those scale out. Orders. Everything I do is always scaling out. Yeah, I haven't actually come up with a proper exit plan for offshore yet. I've um, done one for uranium. I've got a semi um, worked out one for just oil in general. But yeah, I need. Whenever I enter an investment, I usually start to try and figure out how I'm going to scale out. So it's generally 
just to run through my sort of uranium one, I've still got it on my old blog on Trader Fergie. You can just look at the monkey trap. And it was just this idea of this trap in Africa where um, hunters can catch a monkey and all you do is hollow out a, um, a um, it's like a fruit, it's like the shape of a coconut and just make it um, just the size so that a monkey can put its fist in and then fill it full of nuts. And so when the monkey puts its hand in, its hand can just fit through the hole. But once it grabs nuts, it can't get its hand back out and the hunter just walks up and grabs it. And so, of course, it could escape if it let go of the nuts, but it can't bring itself to let go of the nuts. Those so paper gains and, are just too juicy. Yeah, those, <laughs> so that was the analogy for um, trying to hang on to every gain in a bull market will just ensure you get killed on the other side. And so you got kind of got to accept it early that you're going to get out early and you're going to watch it go up for a while. There'll be some speculative blow off. You won't partake in it. Or maybe you do partake in it, but only partake in it with sort of five, 10% of your portfolio max. Um, try and time it with amount that's not going to hurt. And yeah, from there, the article was just kind of splitting it between half psychology, um, behavioral, and the other half just hard, um, hard sort of um, events that you'd see in the sector. Like I think one was like the spot market exceeding term by more than 20%, uh, price exceeding sort of $100 a pound. Um, where have drivers behavior. asking you about uranium stocks? Yeah, the behavioral side, yeah, it was a taxi driver turning around and asking you that your mum saying, aren't you in uranium, the honey or something? You mentioned it to her once. Yeah, the, the guy asking you next to you on the urinal way to a joke on that the other day on Twitter. Um, yeah, just just all the sort of stuff. To, every time you see something like that, just chip 5% off. A good, a good exiting process will be very gradual. It's never binary. If you do, if you make binary exit decisions, you usually stuff it up because you've got so much. Um, you you can pull like a call it like a Stanley Drunkenmiller when he got out uh, Drunkenmiller when he got out of the tech boom and um, he got out early and he just couldn't stand. He did keep these young traders on. He just couldn't stand watch them just making money hand over fist and eventually it got too much for him. He jumped back in. It was near the top and he lost his shirt on the other side. And if he can do it, one of the greatest, the greatest traders in, um, in the sort of, um, in the markets, then I don't know why any of us sort of retail. Uh, yeah, we're not going to be immune will, from that. Yeah. yeah, be immune, getting super excited and starting to believe new narratives. So um, yeah, having a very airtight exit policy is, um, is pretty damn important because it's, yeah, I, I guarantee there'll be people running around with green laser eyes if, when uranium takes off and there'll be people saying that, it, yeah, well, there'll be a whole new raft of narratives that all sound very reasonable and generally they're just justifying the price action and, and yeah, get sucked into like cult-like behavior. This is part of human psychology, really, human behavior. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you're interested in some of the specific names that Ferg has his eye uh, on and his dollars in, again, that's available in the uh, paid uh, premium section of his Substack. Before I get you to finish uh, with a wrap up telling us about that Substack, I want to share just uh, kind of randomly one last uh, chart here because it speaks to, uh, I guess, you and I, uh, you grew up in New Zealand, spent a lot of time in Australia. I spent a lot of time mm. in, uh, in Australia as well. Talking about residential property or even commercial property around the world in markets where you've got this variable mortgage rates uh, and you've seen what's happened like the likes of Vancouver, uh, Auckland, Melbourne, Sydney. I mean, it's, it's insane. Mm. What's, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen here? Uh, I sold all my real estate as of two, 20, 2021, 2022, whenever that COVID bubble uh, went. I had all cash offers, no due diligence, no building and pest, 30 day settlements. And I was like, okay, where do I sign? Uh, I'm out of here. And yet, you know, we still, still kind of grinding against resistance. Yeah. Well, it's, if you haven't watched it, have, have, a, have a look at the great Australian screen. It's this. Okay. Um, this guy, he's um, I think he's CEO of um, freelance.com and he just he gives us 40 minute breakdown of Australia that is just so damn good. And um, 
yeah, I'd recommend everyone give it a watch. Um, uh, but yeah, but to get to cut right to the chase for Australia, it's Australia gets um, all the sort of finance off the international market. It, um, it's going to be a nasty cycle in the fact that unlike, unlike the US and, um, and quite a few parts of Europe, we can't lock in rates for the long term. It's only like maximum sort of you can fix going out three years. So I was actually at a barbecue on the weekend and there was about five Australians. And the first hour was just them moaning about how run over they were getting on their mortgages that they're, they, they'd all been sort of um, fixed during COVID around 2% and now they're all resetting to five, six. And so they're just absolutely hemorrhaging. They're burning through their cash reserves and they're going to have to... Um, they're going to have to hit the bid or um, come up with some um, some other idea, and so that that's kind of it's really important when you understand that dynamic because once that gets going, obviously borrowing off the international market, the rate that that's given is how um, obviously how safe the um, housing market is viewed. So once non-performing loans um, start rising. The interest rate for that money is going to rise, and then that's just going to kick off um, the cycle even more. The higher the rate goes, the more delinquencies, the more non-performing loans. And um, if you watch the, yeah, as I said, the the Great Australian Scream, he's got some of the stats he's got. Like I think it's, I think it's upwards of fifty um, percent of all Australian um, homeowners are now in stress. I think it's seventy percent of um, of rent. Um, Renters are in stress. Um, the labor's no longer like for a while. They just um, keep kind of pumping the uh, immigration to try and bring more workers in. But now the workers just can't live within the um, the property markets. are just too expensive, so they're coming in. They're trying to survive for a year, and then they're just working out the cards and leaving. And it's it's yeah, it's a kid. Keep coming back to that, but yeah, everyone should have a listen. There's even a crane index, which is kind of fascinating. The uh, the amount of cranes, I think it's said there's like 365 Sydney, like 200 and something in Melbourne, and then he like compares it to like New York, there's like 12 or something. Like Chicago, there's like another like 10, and San Francisco is like I don't know, like 15 or so. There was don't ask me, don't ask yeah. me where all this supply is because the rental market is still super tight. Um, so yeah, I, I yeah. don't know where I don't know where all this new supply is coming, but I haven't seen it yet. Yes, yeah. Anyway, so in, in my my view, it's I've I've been I should sort of um, preface this with I've been bearish on Australian property for like five years plus. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm been wrong for a very long time, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But yeah, unfortunately, when it goes, I think it's gonna. It's going to be very, very negative for Australia and, and New Zealand, unfortunately. Yeah, it's kind of the problem where the economy kind of hasn't. You, you can look up like um, the value add of the economy, like how much it's um, how I forget what it's called, like where it's a complexity index or how much value add uh, economy is adding. And Australia is in line with like Laos and like Burma and just like it's. Um, since getting rid of a lot of its manufacturing because it became too expensive, it's really just done two things, dig stuff out of the ground, send to China and blow up a property bubble. And yeah, sell a few passports. Property, and, yeah. yeah. Once that property bubble goes, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a hell of a um, recession. I think it's going to take a long time to kind of reset with a lot of pain. And I don't think many Australians have seen that. I think it's been pretty, pretty easy running for um, a few decades now. Yeah. Yeah, certainly anyone uh, my age uh, in their 30s um, has certainly had it easy in Australia. One of the reasons why I guess uh, this um, geo-arbitraging and offshore is becoming more and more uh, talked about, but we'll save that for perhaps another day. Let's talk about your Substack, sir. Tell us what it's about, what tiers are available to people, and perhaps we'll leave it there until another day. Cheers. Yeah, so I... Um... Parted ways with Crux as of um, just over a month ago now, and um, just decided I wanted to have control over my content and my platform. Um, I want to do this for the long term. I love it, and so yeah, I'm continuing to interview people um, and 
put out yeah whatever trades I'm seeing or any interesting observations I have in the market weekly. That's just a basic level. That's just a video or maybe two videos um, a week, and then how productive I am um, now. And I have a um, now I'm a father, so that's slowed things down a bit with less sleep. So not not as productive as I used to be. And then the Trader Pro is just adding a few extras. That's um, monthly ask me anything. That's longer film interviews, often will be with my mentor. Um, monthly deep dives where I just really dig into some trade setup or some uh, something I'm interested in. Um, and then there's also a private Twitter circle, which is just a, kind of a flow of um, trades I'm trying to get on in my portfolio or things I'm scaling up, scaling down, income trades, um, option trades, all of it. I just wanted a way to be able to put trades in front of people uh, quicker. Because a lot of the stuff I do, I um, I see a setup and I try my luck getting filled. I never get filled. So it would make no sense for me to kind of write it up um, constantly and put it out there because I'm, I'm forever kind of fishing for stuff. It's a lot of how my training works is I'll, I'll just try my luck and see if someone's silly enough to fill me on it or if I get filled by sort of volatility. That's how um, I go into a lot of positions. Mm. Nice. And yeah, I guess the Twitter circle works well. And uh, I guess with the timing of that, there's a far less of a delay in um, compared yeah. to what it would take for you to, to do a long form content. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, guys, links to everything mentioned in today's chat will be in the description. Is there anything you would like to add before we sign off for tonight, sir? No, not really. I think it's just always, um, I think people focus far too much on kind of price action rather than gaining the conviction to, work. whenever you're in commodities, you have to have a very strong view on where the commodity is going. Otherwise, you're just going to get shaken off. It's There's, there's no such thing as a smooth ride um, in any commodity producer or any any way of playing commodities you're always going to have ups and downs and i've i've often referenced but everyone would do well to go and look up um it's an article that um goes over the idea that even god would get fired as an active investor yeah, and it's, it's, this idea that um even if you were god and you could look forward i think i think it's two maybe three years and identify um a handful of the best performing stocks so you knew you are omnipotent you can look forward you know exactly what's going to outperform you know what will be the best ones you would get fired as an active investor because you'd run far too much volatility, volatility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and so it's kind of a fascinating thing is so many people kind of judge their portfolio by volatility and sort of smack them on the hand and themselves on the hand and think they failed when they might be in the perfect allocation they just can't handle it and it's um yeah, it's tough. It's um, it's just yeah important to keep that in mind. And yeah, the only way I've ever kind of thought to deal with that is yeah, just develop more conviction on what you hold. No, no, why you're buying something. Don't just buy something because someone else has said it. Because you'll you'll bail on it the second um, yeah. it has a big drawdown, which is just part of the game. Yeah, so can't that's can't that uh, that conviction, I guess. <laughs> Nice, man. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Trader Ferg, link in the description. Uh, thank you for listening to the RY podcast. Uh, make sure you subscribe and follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and this will be uploaded to Substack. Uh, wishing you all the very best uh, in your trading and in your life, and I look forward to catching up with you in another episode shortly. Take care, guys.